Good evening and welcome to Somerset County Library's Personal Enrichment Series Online. Many of us know somebody that has dementia or Alzheimer's. I personally have had two grandparents that were diagnosed with Alzheimer's and another grandparent that was diagnosed with dementia. And it can be a very difficult thing on the family to deal with. And occasionally you'll, you'll have to, it'll come to a point where you'll have to have conversations with the person that is, is experiencing the dementia or the Alzheimer's. And those can be difficult conversations. So recently the Alzheimer's Association presented a program called Dementia Conversations, Driving Doctor Visits Legal and Financial Planning to help caregivers have a sense of being able to deal with these or conversations, given, given them tips to be able to have these conversations when that time comes. So tonight I want to share with you that program and we'll get started here. Welcome to the Alzheimer's Association's Dementia Conversations program. This program is designed to help you talk with your entire family, including the person with signs of dementia, about some challenging and often uncomfortable topics related to Alzheimer's and dementia. These conversations may not be easy for you or for the person experiencing changes in functioning. There's the fear of hurting those we love, facing changes related to aging and dementia, and being forced to deal with difficult family dynamics. You may try to wait until the time is right to have these conversations, but in reality, that time rarely occurs. The sooner these conversations can take place, the better. This way, the wishes of the person with dementia can be included as much as possible, and unexpected situations can be avoided in the future. The changing needs of the person often signal that it's time to talk. We've heard from many people who tell us that some of the most difficult conversations they had with their parent or family were about going to the doctor to get a diagnosis or medical care, deciding when it's necessary to stop driving, and making plans for managing finances and legal documents to be sure the person's wishes are carried out and the costs of future care are covered. Keep in mind that as we talk about each of these conversations, we offer a variety of approaches. Not all of these will be appropriate for each person. The approach that will work best for you will involve your customizing it to fit the needs and preferences of the person with symptoms and your family. Today's program will share some tips for breaking the ice and having difficult conversations around some of the most common issues that arise when someone shows signs of Alzheimer's or dementia. It will help you plan ahead and build a care team that works and communicates well to reduce some of the stress that can accompany a disease like Alzheimer's. It will also give you the opportunity to hear from people who are dealing with similar issues. These individuals will share how they handled these challenging conversations and it will connect you with helpful resources to enhance the quality of life for everyone involved. You may not think of yourself as a caregiver, but you may be noticing some changes or signs in the person you care about that are causing you concern. Often we find ourselves avoiding or talking ourselves out of difficult conversations around these issues for several reasons. Sometimes our family members say they don't need our help, or we assume that other family members who live closer are taking care of things. Sometimes we fear we might be taking away the person's sense of independence, or the family may disagree about whether or not there's a problem. 
Sooner is better than later. Don't wait for a crisis to occur before having these conversations. You can actually avoid a crisis by talking about the issues and taking action in advance. By talking early in the disease process, you'll be able to hear directly from the person with dementia about his or her wishes while the person can still contribute and be part of the planning process. Despite the difficulty of these conversations, they need to take place to ensure the person's safety and well-being. Successful conversations start with being prepared in advance. Develop a plan for how to finesse the conversation, a way to introduce the topic in a way that will be gentle and minimize resistance. The use of finesse goes beyond honesty. It involves understanding how difficult this conversation can be and thinking about how best to gently position the discussion for a positive outcome. Also consider what you'll do regardless of how the person responds. For example, ask the person whether he or she would want to know if you've noticed any changes in functioning. In most cases, the person will say yes, allowing you to begin the discussion. But if the person says no, that he or she would not want to know about the changes you've noticed, then focus on the fears that accompany these changes and how important it is to talk about the changes openly. The actual conversation about the changes you've noticed may need to take place in a separate conversation. Take notes about the changes you see. Begin observing and note examples of behaviors that concern you. Take notes after you see something of concern so you can accurately talk about what you've noticed. Write those things down so you don't forget the important points you want to cover and bring your notes with you when you have the conversation. Be prepared to talk about your own feelings. Use I statements and try to avoid any suggestion of blame or criticism of the person so he or she is less likely to get defensive or angry. Be gentle in your discussion, keeping the person's feelings in mind. You want to avoid having the person with changes feel ganged up on. Practice in advance. Rehearsing talking about sensitive topics with other family members will help you feel more comfortable when you have the actual conversation with the person with symptoms. Consider possible solutions to offer during the conversation. Initiate the conversation at a place and time when the person is relaxed, well-rested, and comfortable. Sit close to the person, use empathy, and speak from your heart about your concerns. When someone in your life exhibits changes in thinking or behavior, it's important to be aware that they could be signs of Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. There are changes that are typical of aging, though, like taking a longer time to remember names or needing a reminder about how to use the remote control. But you might start to notice issues that go beyond typical aging, like that the person is getting lost in familiar places, withdrawing at social functions, asking the same questions repeatedly, or forgetting recent events. People with dementia typically first recognize signs that have to do with forgetting how to do things they used to do very easily, such as managing money or remembering appointments. Conversations can go more smoothly if reference is made to these changes, rather than just discussing the changes that the person has not noticed in him or herself. Sometimes the person may be reluctant, fearful, or angry when you try to get them to seek help. This can be because of his or her feelings about the disease or because of the effects of the disease itself. It can also reflect his or her cultural traditions, beliefs, or stigma about the disease. But we have some tips and tools that can help you get the person to the doctor. It can feel awkward to approach someone about the changes you've noticed but many times the person has already noticed these changes in him or herself and has some concern. The person may be afraid, and denial is one of the most basic ways we all have to protect ourselves from feeling overwhelmed. But the changes might be due to something other than Alzheimer's, 
and acknowledging this can help get the person to agree to take action. Let's hear from Donna about the importance of having these conversations. I think you have to be honest. I, I, I think that's the important thing with it. To get, to get a loved one to the doctor, I think you just need to be candid and honest of what are you trying to do. It's, we're trying to understand what we're up against. I, I, it, it's just so important to, to do that because you can't battle something that you don't know what you're battling. Again, it could have been, it may not have been Alzheimer's. It could have been depression. It could have been so many other things. And guess what? There's other things you can do to take care of those issues as well. Um, but that's what you need to be able to do. You, you know, you can't ignore something. It's not going to go away. Suggesting a doctor's visit is sometimes all that's needed to get the ball rolling. Other times, though, just being honest and direct isn't enough, and the person needs more support or direction. Here are some ideas that can help. Use words that are most comfortable for the person. Be aware that the person may be sensitive to particular words such as Alzheimer's. For example, you could say, let's talk with the doctor about the fact that you're having more trouble doing some things than you used to, rather than, we need to have you see a doctor to do an assessment for Alzheimer's disease. Let the person know that it's time for the annual wellness visit. The annual wellness visit has been offered at no charge by Medicare since January of 2011. It's a visit for developing or updating a personalized prevention plan that can help prevent disease and disability. It includes an examination of the person's changes in thinking and behavior that may indicate a form of dementia like Alzheimer's disease. Many older adults have not heard of this benefit, but taking advantage of it can be a way to get the person to have their cognition evaluated. They are going to the doctor's office with an enjoyable outing. You may want to suggest going to see the doctor and then doing something enjoyable together, like having lunch at a favorite spot. Invite family members to communicate concerns and questions to the doctor too. Whether you're able to be there for the appointment or not, you can prepare a list of your concerns and questions and provide that information to the doctor before the appointment. Because of doctor-patient confidentiality, and protections under HIPAA regulations, the doctor won't be able to speak with you about his or her patient without a signed release. If your family member agrees to it, it can be very helpful to get a signed release of information that would allow the doctor to communicate directly with you. Doctors have these release forms and they can be signed at the doctor's office. If the person is still reluctant, try using a therapeutic fib. There may be times when the person with symptoms is extremely reluctant to see a doctor, regardless of your attempts to use reason. People with Alzheimer's often experience a reduced ability to use good judgment and make good decisions. Sometimes this contributes to the person's reluctance to go to the doctor. In these situations, the person's safety and care come first. You may need to use a technique that's called the therapeutic fib to get the person to visit the physician's office. Some family members or friends tell the person that a doctor's visit is required by the insurance company or by the doctor in order to authorize prescription refills, renew a policy, etc. Invoking this kind of outside authority can help the visit seem less like a criticism of the person and his or her level of functioning, so resistance is reduced. As we've heard from families, having a conversation about driving may be one of the first difficult conversations needed after a diagnosis. You may notice signs that your family member's driving has changed like accidents or tickets for moving violations, or things that are more subtle, like new scrapes on the car or garage. 
You may have even seen the person make mistakes while you were in the car. Even though many of us will need to stop driving at some point, people are often reluctant to consider the issue for themselves because they're afraid to relinquish their independence. Denial that anything is wrong can allow a dangerous situation to continue, but dealing with the issue early on can help ease the transition. Here's Chris to tell us about how this happened in his family. There's no exact answer on this is when you stop driving. Uh, you can tell when coming up to an intersection, as an example, the ability to understand what's going on around you was starting to deteriorate a little bit. Uh, being on the highway with and first and foremost, the safety of everybody in the car, as well as other drivers on the road. You think about that and you're, you you want to make sure you're not putting anybody in danger. But then the difficult part is telling your dad who you love and you know he loves driving and he's used to it. And he, he can no longer do that. But then even then, taking the keys away full time was very difficult. The doctor was very helpful and just saying, you know, medically, you can't do this anymore. But my mother had the hardest time with this because she knew how much this was going to hurt him as well. And this is one of the first things that we had to deal with as a family when it came to telling my dad that he had to stop doing something because of this disease that meant a lot to him. Whether the changes in driving are due to Alzheimer's or not, here are some ideas that people have found helpful when discussing this sensitive topic. Plan ahead before an accident occurs. Before changes in the ability to drive are seen, talk about the fact that the person will need to stop driving at some point. Many families find it helpful to have an open discussion and develop an agreement about how the person would like you to recognize when it's time to stop driving, such as noticing more mistakes on the road or new scrapes on the car. When the time comes, the person may not remember the conversation, so it can be helpful to write notes about your agreement to use later or even ask the person to sign a driving contract. Express your concern about specific changes you've noticed. Let the person know that you care about and support him or her, and reinforce that as the reason for your concern. Use specific examples to show that there are real problems. For example, last week you did something really different. Here's what happened. That concerned me. Appeal to the person's sense of responsibility and concern for others. For example, you could say, I know that you wouldn't want an accident to happen and for you or someone else to get hurt. If you anticipate that the person may resist having the conversation about driving, there are ways to make it easier. Here's Sheila talking about how she approached it. Some tips on, on having the conversation is pointing out, uh, especially for my father, the potential danger to to others that it may cause if he's behind the wheel, um, and you know just talking about it from the standpoint that this is not only the best thing for you, but this is also the the best thing for others around you and. Um, these are some of the alternatives, making sure that, you know, this is what's going to happen, having a plan. Um, you know, if, if mom can't take you, then Uncle Thomas or some, you know, will, will be here to take you and we will make sure that you're getting out of the house and that you're doing some things. So, you know, presenting the bad news, but then also presenting the plan. Uh, and for, for my father, that's really, really important to have a plan. <laughs> Establish a plan for alternate transportation in advance. Be sure to include transportation to places that will help the person maintain social connections and hobbies, such as going to stores, appointments, bridge club, or church. When you talk with the person, provide reassurance that you want to help maintain his or her active lifestyle and that those needs have been included as part of the plan. 
Incorporate the voice of an esteemed professional and have empathy. Ask a physician to write a letter or a prescription stating that the person must not drive, just as Chris discussed in his video. Use empathy in your conversation and think about ways to foresee and minimize the person's sense of loss. Consider talking about this from the standpoint of retiring from driving rather than giving something up. Here's Wendy talking about a key component to making this conversation a successful one. Talking to somebody about stopping driving, I think it's most important to understand that that is tied to someone's independence more than most things. And so by saying you can't do this anymore is like telling the person, it's like ripping away their independence. And that doesn't feel good for anybody. I, you know, I know that I've always tried to put myself in that situation. What would I think if someone was saying this to me? You don't get to do this anymore. And how would I feel? And how would I want somebody to talk to me about this? <laughs> um, and so if you try to put, I think sometimes too many people try to approach it as, you know, very punitive. And um, I'm doing what's right for you. So why, you know, why don't you understand without really turning the tables and putting themselves in that position and understanding, you know, how helpless that feels to take those things away. Um, it's important to, to be thoughtful about what that experience is like for the individual. One of the ways that we all provide ourselves with choices that maintain our independence is by making legal and financial plans for our futures. Many families do this only to be taken by surprise when dementia enters the picture. As medical and long-term care costs in the U.S. rise, families may need to step in and provide both care and help with the person's finances. Let's listen to Chris again. Financially, this disease will increase the cost of living. It's just a fact. So planning for those extra costs is that much more important than what you were planning for before. And so you have to review everything that's in place, see what changes need to be made, both legally and financially, and you have to monitor that going forward afterwards too. Some people may have plans in place, but may still be uncomfortable discussing their financial status with you. You may also feel reluctant to do anything that may come across as intrusive talk about it. Making legal and financial plans early ensures that the person's preferences are included in the plans and that the family will not need to make rash decisions. It's important to take the time to have these conversations. It can be scary, but it is necessary. In this video, Julie talks about how she talks with friends who ask her about having this kind of conversation with her mother. Here's what I've come to after all of this. That it's the most loving and kind thing you can do for them is to be honest with them and say, this is like a really scary thing. And I feel a lot of discomfort bringing this up to you. But you know, I tell them, if you're going to be the one who's going to take them on this journey, then you have to tell them, I'm going to be here on this journey with you. And there are things that we have to do to get this in place. We're going to go on this journey together. I have told you I'm going to be here with you till the end. So let's get this ready. It's like we're going to go on an ocean ship. We've got to get things packed up. We've got to figure out what we're taking with us. We got to get ready. And the things that we have to get ready, we have to make sure that we know which doctors you're going to be using. I need to get this signed, okay? So that if you go in there and they have to do surgery, for example, I got to have this durable power of attorney for health care for you. I have to have this worked out, okay? Now, if for some reason, okay, you need to go to rehab after something, I have to have these documents here, the financial stuff, so I can get these things taken care of for you while this is going on. I don't want to have anything get in the way of us being able to progress and keep doing this. I said, 
it seems hard because it's hard in our heads. You know, everybody's heard, read about people who've stolen from elderly people, who've done these horrible things. But if you're the person who's approaching this with loving kindness and compassion, and you're willing to take this person on this journey, you're not doing a bad thing. You're doing the right thing by talking to them about it. And you approach it from the standpoint of, I'm here for you. I'm doing this for you. We're going to do this together. And I'm going to help you through this. And these are the tools that I need to make sure that we can do this. Begin by explaining that you're in this together. These discussions may seem to go against some of our societal norms and represent a shift in family roles. Understand that having this conversation will help you and the person with dementia make the plans you'll need to get the best care and will allow you to connect and enjoy your time together in the future. It can be tremendously reassuring to let the person know that you'll be part of the process, both now and in the future. This way, the person you love can feel that you're on the same team. Start by asking questions and gathering documents. Think of the conversation as a chance to ask questions rather than to tell the person something. What documents are in place now and where are they kept? Who has copies of the documents and who should have copies? Who should review these documents? Family? Professionals? Pull the existing documents together and get the ones that still need to be completed or should be altered. Explain that these are standard plans that need to be made as we get older. You can reduce resistance to the process by explaining that having these discussions and completing these documents are things we all need to do as we age. Break the conversation into parts and try different times and locations. If you only have the conversation by phone, try it in person. You can also write a letter to get the conversation started. Don't feel you have to cover everything in one sitting. It may help to do the planning in smaller segments. You can address the person's finances one day and then talk about legal documents at another time. Involve others to help talk about finances. Ask a financial advisor to help with the conversation or involve a brother or a sister. Some families make decisions to pool resources to ensure that care can be provided and the expenses paid. It's important to understand the financial situation so your family can help you make the best long-term care choices. Just as having these difficult conversations is challenging, caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease is also a challenge but there are steps you can take to make things easier for everyone involved. As our veteran caregivers tell us, no one can do this alone. Everyone who provides care for the person is part of a team, and care teams work best when there's good communication. The first step to begin the conversation is by talking with the others on the care team. As with any team, your care team works best when there's an open flow of communication and when decisions are made together. You, the person with dementia, and your other family members are at the center of the team. And whether family members live near the person you're concerned about or far away, everyone can participate. Families typically look to their primary care doctors to help with making medical plans. Other medical professionals who specialize in the area of dementia care may be included to make a diagnosis. Once the diagnosis is made, find out who will be coordinating care on an ongoing basis. This is often the primary care physician. Your care team does not stop there. Peers can be a tremendous support to the core care team members. As the disease progresses and care needs increase, friends can offer much needed breaks and emotional support. 
Everyone who's working and a member of the CARE team should contact their company's HR department or employee assistance program to ask about caregiving benefits. Families can then look at their pool of resources and make decisions about how to proceed. There are community resources available where you work and live. Some are even online, so your entire family can have access to information and support. The Alzheimer's Association Alzheimer's Navigator is a tool that allows your family to create a personalized action plan to connect you with local resources, information, and support. Visit alz.org slash Alzheimer's Navigator. This is just one of the many resources that the Alzheimer's Association provides for people going through one of the most difficult periods in their lives. On the resource list linked below this video, you'll see the programs and services of the association. Take the time to explore the website and check into the resources that are available through your local chapter office. Begin a conversation with your family by sharing the free Alzheimer's Association resources. Remember that no one can provide all of this care alone, and the sooner in the disease process that you have these conversations, the more smoothly the team can function to provide assistance. Helping the person you're concerned about begins with talking and having these difficult conversations. On this slide, you can see our website address and our toll-free 24-7 helpline number. Call or contact us anytime. We're here to help you, your family, and anyone you know who's affected by Alzheimer's or dementia. Call or contact us anytime. Sounds like the best policy is to make sure you have a plan in place for the future so that when your parents' health starts to decline or if their mind starts to decline, you have a plan in place that you know that, okay, at this point we're going to do this. And there's a lot more information available on the Alzheimer's website. You can see the address here, alz.org. And you can set up an account for free. There are a lot of other videos available online that may help you, depending on where you are in the Alzheimer's dementia journey. There is information for caregivers, information for people that are have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And of course, as they were saying, once a person starts the decline of dementia, um, they could get to a point where they don't understand what's going on. So start having those conversations with your family, have plans in place, and you never know what is going to happen in life. It could be dementia, it could be something else that interrupts your flow of life, an accident that leaves you paralyzed. You never know what might happen in life, so it's a good idea to have plans in place just in case something happens. And we will have, there was a handout that was available with this program. I'll have copies of that available at the library. So if you're interested in learning more, you can either go to the alzheimers.org website and get more information there. And I will have copies of this handout available to pick up with some tips about how to handle difficult conversations.